you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over-aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Remember those funny-speaking French Canadians? John Francis Landcott and Maxime Valois? Uh, I mean, Jean-Francois and Maxime? Sure you do. They're the guys that brought us EGLS and a deep dive into the physiology of fluid responsiveness. I know, you miss them. So do we. So much, in fact, that Matt and I have been speaking French for days, yearning for drop T's and long A's. Luckily, they just sent us a talk they prepared on ultrasound mistakes. Now, Matt and I were unaware of any mistakes associated with using ultrasound. We just assumed uh, they were going to discuss not using ultrasound enough, or putting the probe on the patient without gel, or maybe even ultrasounding someone without introducing yourself. You know, grievous errors. But after listening to their talk, it sounds like ultrasound mistakes are rather common in Canada. For this reason, Matt and I are going to look into developing a Canadian Hope Fund aimed at raising money to help the developing city of Canada teach ultrasound so that one day they too can practice medicine like we do in America. Mistake free and proud. Hi, I'm Maxime Valois. And I'm Jean-Francois Langteau. Oh, I almost forgot. Last episode, we announced that we'd be putting the iBook on sale for free, 100% off during the month of April. Scratch that. We changed it to March 15th to April 15th. So, today. All right, get it now while it's hot. www.inkling.com. Search Introduction to Bedside Ultrasound. We wanted everyone coming to CastleFest to be as prepared as possible, whether they had an iPad or not. And we thought we'd go ahead and give it to all of you as well. So, enjoy. Speaking of CastleFest, I'm sorry that it's sold out. I know it's well over a month away, but yes, we're out of spots. There are always a few people that end up canceling, so we put a button on the website where you can get on the waiting list. See you there. I don't know about you, Jeff, but whenever I go to ultrasound conferences or listen to a bunch of ultrasound talks... Oh, crap. One other thing. Speaking of courses, I also forgot to mention that these guys are putting on one of their awesome EGLS courses during the Critical Care Ultrasound Symposium in Montreal, May 10th and 11th. That's ccusinstitute.org. Remember, for those of you that are part of the Ultrasound Leadership Academy, this is included in your tuition. For the rest of you, it's an awesome course, and you should attend if they still have room, which I probably should have asked them about because they usually sell out. Sorry if they're already full. That would have taken me an entire email to figure out. It seems like everything is so much easier with ultrasound. Well, that's because the differential evaporates and diagnoses become crystal clear. We seem to become more efficient. And actually, treatments work better. <laughs> One guy even has me convinced, almost convinced, that our IQ probably rises whenever we hold a probe in hand. Well, maybe yours. <laughs> I believe I can fly. I love cocaine! Well, we often feel like this guy, but things can go wrong. We'll see how and we'll see when. We'll be starting with some more general mistakes and then we'll move along with more specific ones. Sometimes the mistake is actually picking up the probe at the wrong time. Because point of care philosophy in its essence relies on answering precise clinical questions. Thus, you must have a question to answer. Reaching for the probe when the question is ill-defined can transform ultrasound into a distraction. And that would be error number one. A classical example is someone looking for a AAA just because he took his very first ultrasound course the day before. Don't get me wrong, ultrasound can be great for AAA ruptures in the right setting. But we have to make sure we fully grab the clinical context before jumping headfirst with ultrasound. It could actually be counterproductive to find a AAA in a shock patient, only to learn 20 minutes later, once we've had time to speak to the surgeon and the nurse had time to take a rectal temp, that the patient has fever and urine that looks somewhat like pea soup. Sometimes more information is not necessarily better. Our brains like to jump to conclusion. There's undeniable advantages, especially with the pressure under which we sometimes have to work. Jumping to conclusion can help us building ourselves a better story. And the better the story is, the more we want to believe in it. Psychologists refer to this phenomenon as confidence by coherence. Of course, it may be somewhat less efficient if we jump to the wrong conclusions. We'll avoid this, in part, by respecting the point of care philosophy of answering clear clinical questions. And the better we know our limits, the less risk there is. One of the best ways of knowing our limits, or actually expanding them, is to undergo the proper training. Many societies have issued guidelines on how to train. The least we can do is conform ourselves to them. 
Training does take time, but it's unavoidable until training is fully integrated in the undergraduate curriculum. Hence, not bothering to get the appropriate training is error number two. One of the main challenges of ultrasound is image generation, and this goes with knowing what you're looking for. We have a clear clinical question, we better make sure to find the images that can answer it. If we don't, interesting findings might go unnoticed. That would be error number three. Not seeing all of our area of interest. In order to be efficient and accurate in finding the right images, being methodical is essential. In bedside ultrasound, this means first and foremost, finding the landmarks that will allow us to identify our area of interest and then making sure it's in the middle of the screen, kind of. By taking a few moments to enhance the quality of our images, we can greatly make our lives easier. How many times have we seen people looking at suboptimal images, not seeing their area of interest appropriately because they didn't adjust gain? It only takes a few seconds to turn those knobs, and if we don't, well, we'll be committing error number four. And the impact of this error on the quality of our interpretation gets even worse as we go on to more and more advanced applications. Trying to say what the ejection fraction is without being able to have enough gain to see left ventricular wall thickening would be as hazardous to say the least. Gain's a bit like volume on a radio. And beginners are like teenagers, they usually like to crank it up. That's fine, but let's not exaggerate. A general rule can be summed up as black is black. Fluid should somewhat stay black. Then we'll try to use the full screen. I generally try having to have the area of interest cover roughly 80 to 90% of the screen, because this makes it big while keeping a safety margin in the far field to be sure we're not missing out on anything. If your machine has a focus setting, there will be this small marker on the right side of the screen. In order to have a nice image, it must be in, the, in line with what you're looking at. It can, it, can, it can sometimes make a big difference. If you don't see a marker, it's probably automatic and focus will be done on the structures in the middle of the screen, so try center the region of interest. We recently went to give an EGLS course in a hospital out of town, and when we got there, we were all excited and the physicians that contacted us greeted us in the emergency, but they told us they didn't like their machine. No, they hated their machine. And in the end, it was mainly because they didn't know how to adjust many of the settings it had. So for those of you interested in ultrasound, and I guess you are if you're listening to this, it would be worthwhile taking 20, 30 minutes to learn all of these other functions of your machine. It's much more easier than we can think at the start. We just talked about how fun it is for our brain to jump to conclusion. And a very effective way of jumping even faster to our conclusion is substitution. That means changing a hard question that our inconclusive scan cannot answer for an easier one. Now the scary part of it is that we do this much more often than we think. Whether we want it or not, we'll be tempted to do so when we don't recognize that our image is inadequate, that it is inconclusive. And actually, not recognizing the inconclusive scan is error number five. Let's say we're trying to estimate gross LV function, but the best image we have is all screwed up, like in this video. We can't answer our original question, but deep down, we know that a hyperdynamic heart tends to have a fast pace and vice versa. So in this clip, the heart rate seems rather fast, but resist the urge to say it's hyperdynamic because it's going fast. That would be substitution. That would be overstating inconclusive findings. If we want to know how fast the heart rate is, uh, how, how fast is the heart rate? Well, we can look at the monitor. But if we want to know what the ejection fraction is, well, we have to get a better view where we can see wall thickening and all the rest that's important. Wow, that's a lot of mistakes that Canadians make. Obviously, here in the U.S., we would never make those kind of mistakes. But to review for our Canadian listeners, here are the things to avoid. Mistake number one, using ultrasound when you shouldn't. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's usually super useful. But not always. Trying to do transcranial Doppler on the guy with a recent schizophrenic break who thinks the feds have implanted mind control devices in his brain may be tempting, but probably not wise. Mistake number two, complacency. Come on, don't be lazy. 
get the training, go to a course, watch the podcast. They're free. Download the iBook. It's free right now as well. Remember, for the entire next month, it's going to be free on Inkling.com. There are plenty of resources out there. Learn this stuff before you try using it to make clinical decisions. Mistake number three, not being methodical. You've got to be methodical. Yes, this is focused ultrasound. We're not doing big methodical assessments of the abdomen. We have focused questions, but be methodical in your area of focus. If you're looking for free fluid in Morrison's pouch, make sure you get that image of the tip of the liver and scan fully through the actual space. Mistake number four, not optimizing. It usually only takes a couple turns of the gain knob and clicks of the depth button to greatly increase your chances of seeing what you need to see. If you want to get even better, figure out how to zoom to see that common bile duct or yolk sac. Learn how to turn off the MB and THI when you're looking at the lungs. It's easy and worth it. Mistake number five, not recognizing inconclusive scans. If you can't really find the gallbladder in a super obese patient with tons of bowel gas, then don't call it negative. It's not a failure on your part. We get the reads from radiology all the time of inconclusive, recommend CT, or whatever other imaging would be appropriate. While it's frustrating to not have the answer, it's better than making up an answer. Keep looking and thinking. All right, that's not all. There are more mistakes coming from our friends in the North. However, we know we crushed your brain with that basic episode over an hour long a week ago. So that's it for this time. We'll be back with a second part of this in a week or so. Don't forget to spread the word. iBook on Inkling.com, completely free right now. Friends don't let friends pay for an iBook that's free. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, my VCs, let us know how you feel about it.